on the part of the Senate, the joint session is called to order. On the House, part of the House of Representatives, the joint session is called to order. Please rise for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem to be led by the Samiwang Singers of Ilocos Norte. Aming manlilikha, tagapagbigay buhay at liwanag ng sangkatauhan. Salamat po sa iyong pagtangkilig at paggabay sa bansang Pilipinas. Salamat po sa kalayaang magtipon tulad ngayon ayon sa talaga ng aming saligang batas. Salamat po na kami dahil sa kabayanihan, pagsisikap at sakripisyo ng aming mga ninuno at mga bayani ay nabuo upang maging isang bansa at isang malayang demokratikong republika. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Pagpalain niyo po ang aming pagtitipon ngayon upang aming dinggin, liwanagan at suriin ang kalagayan ng bayan, ang state of the nation. At upang italaga sa inyong gabay at tangkilik ang mga magiging hakbangin ng pamahalaan sa pangunguna ng aming Pangulo, Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos Jr. Biyayaan niyo po kami, mga mamamayan at mga namumuno, ng patuloy at tumitibay na pagkakaisa, pagtutulungan, at pagmamahalan bilang pagsunod sa inyong mabuti at magandang kalooban. Kasihan niyo po ang aming Pangulo at ang pangkat ng kanyang mga tagapangasiwa, ang aming mga mambabatas, ang aming mga hukom, at ang mga tagapagpairal ng katarungan ng dalisay at ibayong kaliwanagan, karunungan, katwiran, at katapatan sa kanilang banal na tungkulin. Patuloy niyo kami kong turuan at atahayin kaming lahat na mga mamamayan at mga pinuno tungo sa dakilang pagkakaisa na magbubunga ng ibayong kapayapaan Kaayusan, kaunlaran, kasaganaan, at kasiyahan ng lipunang Pilipino. Magpatuloy po tayo sa personal na panalangin. Mangyari ang bawat isa ay tahimik na manawagan sa may kapal.
Ladies and gentlemen, honorable members of the Congress of the Philippines, His Excellency Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos Jr., President of the Republic of the Philippines. Vice President Sarah Zimmerman Duterte, former Presidents Joseph Ejercito Estrada, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, and Rodrigo Roa Duterte, Senate President Juan Miguel Subiri, and the Honorable Members of the Senate, House Speaker Ferdinand Martin Romualdez, and the Honorable Members of the House of Representatives, Chief Justice. Alexander Gismundo, and the Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court, the Apostolic Nuncio, Most Reverend Charles John Brown, and the esteemed members of the Diplomatic Corps, the Honorable Members of the Cabinet, our First Lady, Luis Araneta Marcos, and our children, Distinguished guests, ang mga minamahal kong mga kababayan, ladies and gentlemen, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. I come before you today to address you as it is my duty as President of the Republic. We live in difficult times brought about by some forces of our own making but certainly also by forces that are beyond our control. But we have, and we will continue to find solutions, and these are some of them. In terms of the economy, we will implement a sound fiscal management. Tax administration reforms will be in place to increase revenue collection. Expenditure priorities will be realigned and spending efficiency will be improved to immediately address the economic scarring arising from the effects of COVID-19 and also to prepare for future shocks. Productivity enhancing investments will be promoted. Our country must become an investment destination capitalizing on the corporate recovery and tax incentives for enterprises with the CREATE law, and economic liberalization laws such as the Public Service Act and the Foreign Investments Act. Ecozones will be fully supported to bring in strategic industries such as those engaged in high-tech manufacturing, health, and medical care, and all emerging technologies. This is also seen to facilitate economic growth outside of Metro Manila. Our tax system will be adjusted in order to catch up with the rapid developments of the digital economy, including the imposition of value-added tax on digital service providers. The initial revenue impact will be around 11.7 billion pesos in 2023 alone. Tax compliance procedures will be simplified to promote ease of paying taxes. We will pursue measures to determine possible undervaluation and or trade misinvoicing of imported goods. Through information and communications technology, the Bureau of Customs will promote streamlined processes. Disbursements for 2022 to 2023 will be maintained at above 20% of gross domestic product or 4.955 trillion pesos and 5.086 trillion pesos, respectively, to ensure continuous implementation of priority programs. Disbursement will further increase over the medium term from 5.402 trillion pesos, or 20.7% of our GDP in 2024, 
to 7.712 trillion pesos or 20.6% of GDP in 2028. The medium-term fiscal strategy of this administration seeks to attain short-term macro fiscal stability while remaining supportive of the country's economic recovery and to promote medium-term fiscal sustainability. Furthermore, and more importantly, Fiscal policy aims to bring together the national government's resources so that these are mobilized and utilized in order to gain the maximum benefit and the high multiplier effects for our economy. Measurable medium-term macroeconomic and fiscal objectives include the following headline numbers. These are based on forecasts that are consistent with the guiding principles of coherence of strategies policy discipline, and fiscal sustainability. 6.5 to 7.5% real gross domestic product growth in 2022. 6.5 to 8% real GDP growth annually between 2023 and 2028. 9% or single digit poverty rate by 2028. 3% national government deficit to GDP ratio by 2028, less than 60% national government debt to GDP ratio by 2025. At least 4,256 US dollar income per capita and the, the attainment of upper middle income status by 2024. The aforementioned headline goals summarize the objectives of this medium-term fiscal strategy being submitted to Congress for its adoption and concurrence to the concurrent resolution by the Senate and House of Representatives. Once adopted, the MTFF will become an anchor for the annual spending and financing plan of the national government and Congress when preparing the annual budget and undertaking related appropriation activities. It is therefore a forward-looking document that extends beyond the traditional three-year horizon to reach six years, coinciding with the six-year coverage of the Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028. The MTFF also promotes transparency and credible commitment to pursue the indicated social macroeconomic goals that optimize the government budget. Medium-term growth targets and the assumptions regarding key macroeconomic variables underpin the medium-term fiscal plan. The recent past and the COVID-19 pandemic has beset the macroeconomic environment with challenges and a series of external shocks. Inflation has accelerated in recent months due largely to significant increases in international prices of oil and other key commodities. Still, the economic growth momentum remains firm as demonstrated by the strong 2022 first quarter GDP growth at 8.3%. However, the recovery process from the impact of the pandemic is still ongoing amid elevated uncertainty in the international economic environment. Revisions in the macroeconomic assumptions incorporate these challenges and most recent economic developments leading to upward adjustments in the following. Inflation rate for 2022 to 2023, foreign exchange rate for 2023 to 2025, and goods and services imports growth for 2022. The economy is expected to grow by 6.5 to 7.5 percent this year as we continue to reopen the economy while considering the recent external developments. In the first quarter alone, GDP saw an increase in household consumption and private investments, along with a robust manufacturing industry, high vaccination rate, improved health care capacity, and an upward trend in tourism and employment. This is expected to continue for the rest of the year. The strong economic growth is projected to be sustained and expanded further to 6.5 to 8 percent from 2023 until 2028. 
The average inflation for 2022 is projected to range from 4.5 to 5.5 percent, following the uptick in fuel and food prices as a result of the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict and the dis disrupted supply chains. It is slightly adjusted to 2.5 to 4.5% in 2023 and is seen to return to the target range of 2.0 to 4.0% by 2024 until 2028. Dubai crude oil price is expected to settle at 90 to 110 US dollars per barrel in 2022. 80 to 100 US dollars per barrel in 2023 and 70 to 90 US dollars per barrel from 2024 onwards as oil supply is expected to catch up and stabilize over the medium term. The Philippine peso is projected to average between 51 to 53 pesos per US dollar in 2022 and 51 to 55 pesos per U.S. dollar from 2023 onwards due to aggressive monetary policy tightening by the U.S. Federal Reserve, market aversion amid the Russian-Ukraine conflict, and again, increased global oil prices. Lastly, exports of goods are expected to grow by 7% in 2022 and 6% from 2023 to 2028. On the other hand, imports of goods are projected to grow by 18% in 2022, 6% in 2023, and 8% from 2024 to 2028. I have instructed the NEDA to coordinate with other agencies and work on the Philippine Development Plan for 2023 to 28 and to submit to me the complete blueprint and progress of its implementation not later than year end. One of the main drivers of our push for growth and employment will be in the agricultural sector. With regard to food supply, we are confronted by a two-pronged problem, that which will hit us in the short term and that which will hit us in the long term. Tayo ay nahaharap sa mga problemang kagyat nating mararamdaman at mga hamong pangmatagalan ang mga suliling agarang mararamdaman ng ating mga kababayan ay ang posibilidad ng tuloy-tuloy na pagsipa ng presyo ng pagkain at kakulangan sa supply ng ating pagkain. Upang masuportahan ang mabimili para mapanatili ang kanilang purchasing power o kapangyarihan sa pagbili, Isinapinal ng Department of Agriculture ang planong taasan ang produksyon sa susunod na panahon ng pagtanim o planting season sa pamamagitan ng tulong pinansyal at teknikal. Magbibigay tayo ng pautang habang mas ilalapit natin sa sektor ng agrikultura ang hindi gaanong mahal na farm inputs na bibilhin na ng bulto ng gobyerno. Kabilang dito ang abono pestisidyo, mga punla, feeds, fuel subsidy, at ayuda para sa mga karapat-dapat na beneficiaryo. Para sa pangmatagalang solusyon, itataas natin ang produksyon ng mga kalakal at produktong pang-agrikultura. At para magawa ito, pagtitibayin natin ang tinatawag na value chain na nagsisimula sa mga magsasaka hanggang sa mga namimili. May mga bahagi ng value chain na sa ngayon ay kanyang-kanya, kanya-kanya ang operasyon. Pagtibayin natin ang koordinasyon ng iba't ibang bahagi nito. Ang pagsasaliksik para sa mga makabagong paraan at ng pagtatanim at pag-aalaga ng hayop ay masusing gagabayan ng Department of Agriculture. Ang produksyon ng farm inputs o mga kakailanganin ng mga magsasaka sa pagpapalago ng kanilang sakahan ay ating iaayon sa mga hamong dala ng climate change at global warming. Mahigpit na pagsusuri ang gagawin ng ating mga eksperto tungo dito. Ang mga pautang at financial assistance sa mga magbubukid at mangingisda ay magiging institusyon at patakaran ng aking administrasyon.
Ipapapriyoridad natin ang modernisasyon ng mga sakahan sa pamamagitan ng mga makabagong teknolohiya para sa ating mga magsasaka. Atin palalawakin ang mga palaisdaan, babuyan at manukan. Lahat ng ito gagamitan ng siyensya para tumaas ang produksyong agrikultural. Maging ang post-production at processing ay susuportahan ng pamahalaan. Gagawa tayo ng network, national network ng farm-to-market road upang mas mabilis na mailakbay ang mga, ng mga magsasaka ang kanilang mga produkto sa mga pamilihan. At gagawa tayo ng mga paraan upang maramdaman ng mga mamimili ang pagluluwag ng presyo ng mga produktong pagkain sa kayang halaga. Gaya ng muling pagbubuhay ng mga kadiwa center, hindi ito magagawa sa isang araw, hindi magagawa sa isang buwan o isang taon lamang. Ngunit, kailangan na natin simulaan ngayon. Ang Agrarian Reform Program ay dapat magpatuloy Agrarian reform is not only about acquisition, but also about support services and distribution. To assist this, I intend to issue an executive order to impose a one-year moratorium on the payment of land amortization and interest payments. This is included in Republic Act No. 11469 or the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act. A moratorium will give the farmers the ability to channel the resources in developing their farms, maximizing their capacity to produce, and propel the growth of our economy. <clears throat> Civil society organizations also support this because it will unburden the farmers of their dues and be able to focus on improving farm productivity. Congress must also pass a law that will emancipate the agrarian reform beneficiaries from the agrarian reform debt burden, thereby amending Section 26 of Republic Act 6657. In this law, the loans of agrarian reform beneficiaries with unpaid amortization and interest shall be condoned. Layunin ng batas na ito ay burahin ang hindi mabayarang utang ng ating mga magsasaka na beneficiaryo ng agrarian reform. Agrarian reform beneficiaries who are still to receive their awarded land under, com under the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program shall receive it without any obligation to pay any amortization. The condonation of the existing agrarian reform loan will cover the amount of 58.125 billion pesos, benefiting 654,000 agrarian reform beneficiaries and involving a total of 1.18 million hectares of awarded lands. Executive Order No. 75, Series 2019, requires that all government agencies, bureaus, departments, and instrumentalities to turn over agricultural lands to qualified agrarian reform beneficiaries. At present, we have a total of 52,000 hectares of unused agricultural lands of the government, which shall now be used for distribution to the following sectors in accordance with Section 40 of the Republic Act number 6657 as amended. Thus, landless war veterans, landless surviving spouse and orphans of war veterans, landless retirees of the armed forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police. Agricultural lands acquired under this program will be given to graduates of college degrees in agriculture who are landless. The call of the times is for the infusion of fresh and new blood in the agricultural sector. We need a new breed of farmers equipped 
with modern agricultural technology able to engage in sustained scientific farming that will not only increase farm yields, but also resilience in the face, in the face of climate change. They say that each brand has a story. As for the Filipino brand, ours is deeply rooted in our rich cultural heritage and the tourism sector plays an invaluable role in the promotion of the Filipino brand. Tourism is not only an important economic development tool, but the abundance of opportunities that the sector creates in terms of regular employment and even job creation at the grassroots level is undeniable. To boost our tourism industry, we will first and foremost make basic developments, such as road improvements for easier access to tourism spots. We will also upgrade our airports and create more international, more international <laughs> airports to help decongest more international airports to help decongest the bottleneck in the Manila airport. We will also make it more convenient for travelers to go around the country, even to remote areas to help promote undiscovered tourist spots. This program will be led by the Department of Tourism together with the Department of Public Works and Highways. <laughs> to foster the Filipino brand, is to spark our sense of pride and reaffirm our strong sense of identity. It is time to welcome the rest of the world with an enhanced Filipino brand that is unique, attractive, and creative. The creativity of the Filipino is truly world-class. We excel in arts and culture, new media, live events, avenues which generate primary and downstream jobs for our creative and talented countrymen. Unfortunately, ang mga hanap buhay na ito ang unang pinadapa ng pandemya at ang pinakahuli namang makabalik sa normal. The creative industry likewise faces many challenges including workplace conditions, working hours, intellectual property rights, and the welfare of our beloved freelancers who were left vulnerable during the height of the pandemic. We require an institutionalized creative industry that will advance the in interest of its stakeholders. Sila na nagbibigay ng kaluluwa at pagkakilala sa ating pagkapilipino. Protektahan natin sila. The Department of Social Welfare and Development has a large part to play in all of this. Magpapatuloy ang ating pagkalinga sa ating mga kababayan na lubos na nangangailangan. Hindi po natin sila pababayaan. Mangunguna sa pag-aagapay sa kanila ang Department of Social Welfare and Development. Utos ko sa DSWD ang mabilis na pagtugon sa pangangailangan ng mga biktima ng kalamidad at mga iba't ibang krisis. Ang mga field office nila ay inatasan na maagang maglagak ng family food packs at non-food essentials sa mga LGU bago pa man manalasa ang anumang kalamidad. Magdadagdag tayo ng mga operation center, warehouse at imbakan ng relief goods, lalo na sa mga malalayong lugar na mahirap marating. Titiyakin natin na maayos ang koordinasyon ng DSWD at Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development ng sa ganun. Madali ang pagpatupad ng Emergency Shelter Assistance Program para sa mga biktima ng kahit anong kalamidad. Pagtitibayin pa natin ang komprehensibong programang Assistance to Individuals in Crisis Situations o ang ating tinatawag na AICS para maiparating ang tulong sa mas maraming biktima. Hindi natin, hindi natin papahirapan ang mga biktima ng krisis na dudulog sa ahensya. Gagawin nating simple ang proseso ng paghingi at pagparating ng tulong. Dahil hindi naman dapat dinadagdagan pa ang hirap ng nararanasan ng ating mga mamamayan. Upang matiyak na mapupunta sa kwalipikadong mga pamilya, 
ang tulong na pamahalaan sa pamamagitan na Four Peace o Pantawid Pamilya Pilipino Program, titiyakin natin na malilinis ang listahan ng beneficiaryo. Higit na, higit na sa isang milyong pangalan na ang nakapag-graduate na sa listahan. At nagagalak akong mabatid na, na, mabatid na sila ay nakakatayo na sa kanilang sariling paa. Kaugnay nito ay inutusan ko ang DSWD na pag-ibayuhin pa ang pagripaso ng listahan upang maitutok ang pamimigay ng sapat na ayuda sa mga lubos na nangangailangang pamilya. Magpapatuloy ang Supplemental Feeding Program para sa mga bata sa Child Development Centers at Supervised Neighborhood Play at lalo pa nating palalawakin sa taong 2023. Hindi rin natin nakakalimutan ang mga solo parents at mga nanay na nahiwalay sa kanilang mga mister dahil sa karasang. Pagtitibayin natin ang programa sa Violence Against Women and Their Children. Kabila na ang, kabila, kabilang na ang counsel, counseling para sa mga biktima, katuwang ang ating mga LGU. Tiyakin natin na sapat ang pondo sa halos pitumpung residential care centers at pitong non-residential care centers para sa vulnerable sectors at persons with disabilities na sumisilong dito. Sa ating sitwasyon ng pangkalusugan, nariyan pa rin ang banta ng COVID-19. Lalo't may mga nadidiskubring bagong variant ng coronavirus. Pero hindi na natin kakayanin ang isa pang lockdown. Wala na tayong gagawing lockdown. Dapat natin balansihin ng maayos ang kalusugan at kapakanan ng ating mga mamamayan sa isang banda at ang ekonomiya naman sa kabilang banda. Nakikipagtulungan ang iba't ibang ahensya ng pamahalaan sa pagmonitor sa mga COVID-19 hospital admission upang makatiyak tayo na may sapat na kapasidad ang ating healthcare system at may iwasan ang pagsipan ng bilang ng nagkakasakit. Patuloy din ang ating vaccine booster rollout para sa ating pangkalahatang depensa. Sa ganitong paraan, kahit pa tumaas muli ang bilang ng mga COVID cases, mananatiling mababa ang bilang ng mga maospital at bilang ng mga namamatay. Sa pamamagitan nito, unti-unti rin tayong masasanay Nanarian ang virus pero hindi na seryoso ang banta sa ating buhay. Iaayon natin ang ating mga health protocols sa kung ano ang ating pangangailangan sa paglipas ng panahon at lalo pang iibayuhin ang kooperasyon kasama ang pribadong sektor upang tumaas pa ang kumpiyansa ng mga mamumunuhan Nang sa gayon ay bumalik na tayo sa full capacity, lalo-lalo na ang ating mga negosyo. Pagpa, pag, pagbubutihan pa natin ang pagpapakalat ng tamang impormasyon ukol sa COVID, kasama ang kahalagahan ng bakuna. Mananatili muna sa ngayon ang alert level system natin. Pinapag-aralan natin ang ibang paraan ng klasifikasyon upang mas babagay sa kasalukuyang sitwasyon, lalong-lalo na sa pagbabago ng COVID. Sa pakikipagtulungan ng Kongreso, itatatag natin ang ating sariling Center for Disease Control and Prevention at ang isang Vaccine Institute. Magtatayo tayo ng dagdag na mga health center at ospital. But beyond the issues that the pandemic has brought, the need for a stronger health care system is self-evident. We must bring services, medical services to the people and not wait for them to come to our hospitals and health care centers. 
na pakinabangan natin ng husto ang malalaking specialty hospital gaya ng Heart Center, Lung Center, Children's Hospital at National Kidney and Transplant Institute. Kaya maliwanag na na hindi lang dapat dito sa National Capital Region kundi maging sa ibang parte ng bansa. Maliwanag na hindi lamang dapat dito lamang sa National Capital Region kundi maging sa ibang parte ng bansa, kailangan magdagdag ng ganitong uri ng mga pagamutan. Bukod dito, upang mailapit natin ang healthcare system sa taong bayan, nang hindi sila kailangan pumunta sa sentro ng kanilang bayan, lalawigan o region, ay maglalagay tayo ng mga klinik, mga RHU, na pupuntahan ng mga doktor, nurse, midwife, medtech, isang beses, dalawang beses sa isang linggo. Nang sa ganun, magiging mas madali sa may karamdaman na magpapagamot ng hindi, pa, hindi na kailangan magbiyahe ng malayo. One of the cornerstones of a strong healthcare system is the provision of competent and efficient medical professionals. We will exert all efforts to improve the welfare of our doctors, our nurses, and other medical frontliners. <laughs> Dapat din tayong magkaroon ng sapat na supply ng gamot na kinakailangan sa pang-araw-araw ng ating mga mamamayan. Sinimulan ko na ang pakikipag-usap sa mga kumpanya ng gamot dito sa Pilipinas at sa ibang bansa. Hinihikayat natin na buksan nila ang berkado upang bumaba ang presyo ng gamot. Halimbawa, kung mas marami ang mas murang generic o hindi branded na gamot sa merkado, mas bababa mas bababa rin ang presyo dahil sa kompetisyon. Ang Department of Trade and Industry ay nakikipag-usap sa mga interesadong manufacturer ng generic drugs na papasok sa ating bansa. Inuutusan ko naman ang Philippine Competition Commission na pantay-pantay dapat at walang kartel sa hanay ng mga pharmaceutical companies. Dahil kapag bukas ang merkado, bababa ang presyo ng gamot para mapakinabangan ng ating mga mamamayan. This is one of the hard lessons that we learned when the pandemic struck and therefore we must act on that shortcoming. In the educational sector, I believe it is time for our children to return to full face-to-face -face classes once again. The Department of Education, led by our highly able Vice President Sara Duterte, is now preparing is now preparing for its implementation in the upcoming school year with utmost consideration for the safety of students as we are still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
We must ensure that our classrooms are safe for teachers, for students, and the entire academic community when they return to face-to-face -face classes. We continue to encourage everyone to get their booster shots in preparation for the resumption of in-person classes. This is one of the reasons I have directed the Department of Health and the Department of Interior and Local Government to undertake another rollout of booster shots. The condition and availability of school rooms for our students must also be addressed, again, in coordination with the Department of Public Works and Highways. Though some complications have arisen, over the question of repair of school buildings in relation to the Mandanas Garcia ruling, this will be ironed out. We have been in discussion with local government leaders, governors, and mayors in the last few weeks to determine with the LGUs what is actually practicable, what functions belong to the LGUs, and what belong to the national government. There have also been lengthy discussions on the continuation and viability of the K-12 school, school system. We are giving this careful review, and all necessarily necessary inputs and points of view are now being considered. In the longer term, we are in Instituting a program of refresher courses and retrainings for our teachers so they can stay abreast of the rapid growth in technology, especially in this post-pandemic world. As for, as for the horror stories that we have heard about the poor quality of educational materials and supplies that are being given to our schools, this must end. <laughs> our children must always be equipped with the best that we can provide. Ang edukasyon ay ang tangi nating pamana sa ating mga anak na hindi mawawaldas. Kaya anumang gastusin sa kanilang pag-aaral ay hindi tayo nag- titipid. Hindi rin tayo nagtatapon. And once again, I am not talking about history or what is being taught. I am talking about material that are necessary for effective teaching in this day and age. Children now need connectivity to the internet. They need devices to use. They need computers, educational tools. <laughs> so that they might participate fully in the digital community here and abroad. We must do better in the international rankings, especially when it comes to the so-called STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. These skills, this knowledge, are necessary for our young people to be able to compete in a highly technological and competitive world. The raw talent is there in our young people. It is up to our educational system to develop and to refine that great pool of talent.